all so much for coming out. My name is Olivia Vammenskoten, and I'd like to tell you a story today. And it starts about two years ago, when I was about to enter Northeastern University. Like most 18-year-olds, I had a very theoretical sense of what was going on around me. No real clear idea of who I was as a person, where I was going, what I wanted. And this wasn't reflected, excuse me, this was reflected incredibly powerfully, especially in the way that I thought about social justice and feminism. It's something that I've been interested in from a very young age, but something up until my time at Northeastern, I didn't have very many real life experiences to which I could apply this knowledge. So I kind of stumbled my way into Northeastern, uh, very haphazard, and I am so grateful that I stumbled exactly where I did. This is my very haphazard sense of what was going on. I wandered into an information session about strong women, strong girls. For, the, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, it's a feminist mentoring organization on our campus that mentors girls in the Boston public school system in grades three through five. We have about 60 mentors each semester that will serve approximately 200 girls. And the entire ethos is one of empowerment. We sit around, we talk with the girls every day about what it means to be a, excuse me, not every day, every week about what it means to be a strong woman what makes a strong woman, how we can apply those things to our own lives, and it gives us a space in which we can talk about the particular tribulations of being a woman in our modern times. But I didn't know any of that when I walked into our commitment night in 2014, completely clueless. All I did know was that I was surrounded by 60 people who were smiling and laughing and talking about the patriarchy and how much they wanted to empower other people, and I was like, yes, I walked into the right room, this is perfect. It was very exciting, and that night, of course, I understood that I walked into an incredible group of people, but I really start to un started to understand how amazing that was in the days that were to come. We're all well, most of us are university students here. We all remember, I hope, how challenging it was in those first couple of weeks as a first year, and if you're like me and you moved all the way from Columbus, Ohio, you don't really know what's going on around you. But it was very clear that I had 60 people around me who were willing to listen to me, care for me, be patient with me and my little first year foibles. And I realized this is a very compassionate community. They were willing to recognize that I was having a difficult time and not only acknowledge it, but respond to it. They were willing to give up their time, their energy, and their emotional energy to help me. And very soon after I realized that, I found myself wanting to do a little bit more in my daily interactions with other people. I wanted to listen a little bit better. I wanted to care just a little bit more. I wanted to be as compassionate as the women around me, which was perfect because it was about this time that I was thrown into a room of 10-year-olds. And for those of you who work with children know that kids, they just want to be listened to, cared for, they want you to be funny, and they want you to be compassionate. They want you to give these things that the women around me had taught me. So it worked out quite well. I began working at the Curley Elementary School in Jamaica Plains with an incredible, inspiring group of young girls who constantly forced me to open my eyes. And the more I listened to them, the more we talked, the more I found that there were several differences between the childhood that I had had growing up and the childhood that some of my girls lived. And my very theoretical understanding of social justice hadn't prepared me for the real life experiences of these girls, where I could read something about gun violence, immigration problems, racism, classism, poverty. These girls were living it. It was something that I could walk away from and something that they couldn't. And this disparity was something that I hadn't earned and they certainly hadn't earned. It was simply a result of a very broken social structure. And so with this in mind, it, it just, it broke me that these girls, my reading material was their reality that could not sit right with me. And it was at this point that I realized my very theoretical understanding of social justice and the world that I wanted to see could no longer suffice. Theory only goes so far. It's action that will eventually make the kind of world that I want to live in. And so I became very angry, armed with this new sense of compassion. I realized I want to do something. I have to do something. And it was at about this time that I was named one of Strong Women, Strong Girls Outreach Co-Coordinators, which was a fantastic means to which I could channel this new drive. And it was also at about this time that I learned about the tampon tax, which for those of you who don't know, in 45 of the 50 United States, tampons have a sales tax, which is kind of ridiculous considering that Viagra and men's razors do not. 
For those of you who experience periods, you know that a tampon is an incredibly necessary good. Without access to sanitary items, people fit risk incredible risk for that was redundant. People risk infection and further disease, not to mention the sheer humiliation of not having a tampon when you really need one. The injustice of it rankled me. It seemed like one of the most gross manifestations of injustice in our society, that you could not have a tampon when you desperately need one. So I decided I was going to organize a tampon drive with the help of Strong Women, Strong Girls. And in November of 2015, about three times a week for four weeks, myself and the other members of the e-board, we went into the Curry Indoor Quad and we asked people for tampons. Some of them turned red and ran away. Some of them just ran away. Some people laughed and ran away. But some people were very willing to give us their tampons, tampons that they had lying around in their backpack. Some people were kind enough to go out to Wollaston's and bring us tampons that they had bought. It was all very kind. And at the end, we ended up having 604 tampons, a product of which I could not have been more proud. It was astonishing. I was so pleased. We donated them to local women's resource center, Rosie's Place, a fantastic organization that you should all check out if you haven't heard or haven't volunteered before. And flushed with this success, I realized that I wanted to try it again. But this time, bigger, better, more tampons than anyone could ever imagine. <laughs> I was incredibly excited. So with the help, again, of Strong Women, Strong Girls, this time it wasn't just the e-board. We involved our whole chapter. We had about 20 of our mentors willing to donate their time, um, this time for four tabling sessions for four weeks in an event we aptly called My Bloody Valentine. As, <laughs> as we, again, we asked people for their tampons. But this time we, we asked a couple more people. We asked more coworkers, more friends, more family members, more mortal enemies, more people who were running away from us. It was fantastic. We chased people, and the yield was astonishing. We more than quadrupled our yield from the first tampon drive that we did. We finished with over 2,500 tampons, which, <laughs> which completely floored me. The product of my incredible anger and the shared anger of everyone around me had culminated in what we estimate in products that could cover maybe 80 periods, which was very exciting because, as we all know, when you really need a tampon, you really need a tampon. <laughs> and so we found out the total yield of that drive about a month ago. It's March now, and our event ended in March 1st. And since then, I've had a lot of time to think about what this really means to me, aside from the sheer numbers of it all. And I think that, I hope you've noticed, I've, I've learned something very important. And it's that compassion is never wasted. The compassion that people invested in me my whole life, and especially in those first couple weeks at college, allowed me to invest a little more compassion in the girls and in the women around me and in the people who don't have access to sanitary items. And I hope that the compassion that I invested in them has allowed them to invest a little more compassion in everyone else. On Strong Women, Strong Girls, we have a saying called hashtag cycles of mutual empowerment, <laughs> whereby empowering someone else, we allow them to empower another person until you have this one wonderful cycle of change in which you cannot stop yourself from being kind. And compassion becomes the place from where you act. And it becomes the drive for all your doings. Compassion is the thing that has allowed me to look past my own differences into the lives of other people. Compassion allows me to see the shared humanity that we all have, not only to recognize the injustices that other people face, but to act on them. And that's really what we need. So I must repeat, please be kind. As we all go out into our lives, I implore you, act with compassion. You will be surprised by the things that you do. Thank you. Ah!